What's up guys, I'm Michael Essa. This is Tyler from Tie Speed. Uh, he's gonna help us out. So we've got this B58 here. He knows BMW engines, but he knows B58s also, and I know very little about them. So Tyler, what do you think's going on? Well, it's gonna be interesting to see, but uh, as this platform becomes more and more relevant uh, in the market here, we're seeing a lot more failures as people begin to push these power output levels. So I'll be interested to see myself, but I know you are running E85, so that obviously has something to do with the story here. Uh, and I'm sure we're gonna find out once we get this thing torn down, but hopefully we can rebuild it in a way that makes it not happen again. So. Yeah, I, I kind of have an idea of what was going on. So it's got rod knock. We know it spun a rod bearing, uh, a lot of debris in the oil pan. Um, we first built the car, the valve cover has the oil, air oil separator breather system built into it and it actually goes right here. And so that's drawing air from the intake manifold, actually pulling vapor out of the crankcase and out of the uh, valve cover yep. uh, and burning it. But that failed, so we blocked it off to get the car running. Uh, and then when we pulled the valve cover, it was like wet in there, like yep. so much moisture that was mixing with the oil and basically turning it into a solvent. Yes, thinned it out. Yep, and uh, that I think is what ultimately killed it. Lack of lubrication. Exactly. It's Monday, we gotta tear this thing apart and put it all back together with a lot of new parts by tomorrow so we can go to the track on Wednesday. All right, man, you ready to tear this thing apart? Let's go, man. All right, let's do it. With the deadline looming, Michael and Tyler began their thrash by removing anything in their way, including the oil filter housing and ancillaries. Knowing where the issue likely lies, their next step was removing the valve cover to look for a potential cause. So this is our uh, oil pressure control valve. So modern BMW F-Series engines use uh, a pressure relief valve to control oil pressure in the engine. And this is one of the first things that will uh, be encountered as the oil leaves the pump. And the screen on this is actually quite clean. So that's actually good news for us. Yeah, so there's no debris in there. There's, yeah. there's no debris in like the main oil galleys for uh, the engine, including the main bearings and the rod bearings. We'll see how far it goes, but this is a pretty good sign that there's not a lot of debris going on there because that would be one of the first places we would find metal if it was in the bottom end of the motor. So that's definitely need a good cleaning. Yeah. This out. And then I'm hoping that uh, no debris, it went through the filter. It did. Caught it and didn't go into the cooler. Okay. All right, so we actually have to get it off the sand now, right? Because we have to do yeah. the timing. I mean, uh, we can actually pull the head off right now to make it lighter. Okay, and just, yeah, just get the uh, the, the adjusters off. And yeah. Then, uh, and then we'll pull the whole head. I'm going to just pull these uh, two off here so they're out of the way. Cause cool, I'll start working fragile. on the camera. Yeah. So this is the, uh, this is the crankshaft position sensor. And this is, goes down through the block to a Hall effect sensor uh, that's mounted to the back of the crankshaft, and this just measures crankshaft speed. But this is pretty delicate. Um, older cars have like a metal one that measures elsewhere on the crankshaft, but as you can see, it's long, thin, and plastic, so we just want to take that out of the way so it doesn't get damaged when we pull this off the engine stand. Next up was oil pan removal. The spun bearing assumed to be the failure sits just above the oil pan. Any evidence of that failure would be found at the bottom of the pan in the form of some nasty metal flakes. Another thing uh, BMW got rid of with these new motors is they got rid of the one-time use hardware, which is nice, as well as the fact is all of the gaskets on the timing cover on the back and the oil pan are RTV. So definitely gonna help control leaks, I think, over the longevity of these motors as they last, uh, you know, upwards of 100,000 miles where you would normally be replacing gaskets on these cars. So that's a plus. That should that's, be, that's not good. That should be inside the motor. <laughs> In a solid piece. Yeah, yeah, not good. We're just kind of visually setting the top engine to top dead center, yeah. Um, so we're just gonna come around until it's at 90. Perpendicular in the bore here, which is not how you would do it when you were assembling the engine, but for right now it doesn't matter. So this cam sensor is just held on by that Allen, but does it have like a groove that it goes into to like it just, positioning? It, it is, yeah, it's, it's uh, looser than you think. And I think it's uh, as a result of that, the, um, the signal that it's picking up is probably adaptable because otherwise it would oh, be a, a precision fit. Kind of yeah, yeah, so we're gonna be careful. It's just when you go to put it back on, you just gotta be like really careful. It's like three Newton meters. Oh, got with, it. With like red Loctite. Yeah. yeah, it'll snap right in half. What I did was I marked it last time, but I, I'm pretty sure that as you tighten it up, it kind of like centers itself, but you just got to be really easy with but it. But as far as like clocking goes? Clocking wise it, it goes, like yeah. It has a flat spot or something? It does something? have a flat spot on it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And it looks like it's basically buried all the way back as far as it'll go there, so that's... Yeah. So that in terms of like like where to position it, yeah, you should yeah. okay. So while Mike's doing that, I'm going to be putting the uh, timing jig on, which we need to set the motor at top dead center first. We did that. So we're going to be using um, this timing jig here to lock the camshafts in place so we can release uh, these centralized uh, oil valves for the Vano system. Um, they're quite tight on there. We're gonna need like a half inch drive. You don't wanna crack those loose with an impact wrench or 
uh, without the cams being tightened down, you can break the timing chain, the guide, there's all kinds of bad stuff that can happen. So kind of a necessary step here is to lock this in place before we pull that off. And what I noticed when I was working on this before was that these go on any direction. Any there's no grooves, there's no tabs, yep. they just sit there flat against it and yep. get clamped down. Yeah. So you gotta make sure those are tight. So a little tidbit about that too is uh, basically the timing on these motors is, let's call it infinitely variable, right? And the motor can adapt uh, about five to seven degrees from what I've understood yeah. uh, once you install it. So like on Michael's S54, when you put that together, that's like assembling a Rolex. If you miss a tooth, if you're off by a degree, if you're whatever, either the motor's gonna blow up, it's not gonna be happy, it's not gonna run right. These cars, they try to take that um, that out of you know the equation by allowing you to pretty much just lock the cams, lock the crank, put the chain on yeah. and tighten the bolts. That's really all you gotta do for, for timing, which is really helpful. There's a groove cut into the, uh, the camshaft to align the tool, and that will only fit flush with this bridge when the motor's at top dead center or very, very close to it. So, you know, we made sure that the motor was as close to top dead center as we can get it, and now we're locking the cams in place so that we can remove these bolts. Yeah, so the cam basically is round and it has these two flat spots machined into it. This thing looks kind of like a horseshoe, slides onto it, keeps the cam located so when it's at top dead center it holds everything in place but right now we're using it to hold the cams from turning while we're cracking those vanus bolts loose you can see that's what it looks like here and that fits directly onto the camshaft itself let's take a little locking bridge you can see the amount of force required to break that bolt loose if you had put all that pressure on the chain uh, and the guides it would have it would have snapped all the plastic in there easily all right, so I'll just leave these loose. Yep. We'll pull the tensioner, and that guy um, off, yep. we'll pull that, and then that uh, should be good to I think, at least pull those off. Yeah, I think that we're gonna have one more problem, and I think that's because that lower tensioner uh, piece there has oh. a bolt that goes through. Okay, well, uh, we'll get these off, and then I guess yeah, we'll, we'll go, from there. go from there, yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna start cracking the head bolts now, so Tim here's gonna help me hold this block because it's under a lot of force. He's got ARPs now, so. Not as tight as the factory head bolts, which are torqued to yield. Okay, so we're going to crack all these loose. So we are going to pull the head off, but it's going to have to come straight up. All right, I'll pop it just to make sure yep. it's not like stuck. Oh yeah, it's no, nice and loose. Free. Straight, straight up, up. Like, well, straight up to the... Uh, hold on, you're too high in the back. Okay. There you go. Very good. All right, walk and then it over. to my table here. Yeah. Without the cylinder head, Michael and Tyler are able to get right to the engine failure suspected root cause. Yeah, so we've gone ahead and uh, pulled out cylinder three, which is the failed cylinder piston. Uh, I have that here in my hands. The failure point at this time is obviously a spun rod bearing. So you can see all of the galling uh, that is taking place from that bearing spinning in place on the bottom of that rod there. That's not normal. Um, the tangs and tabs are still intact, so that means it really didn't spin that much, luckily, before it did fail. Otherwise, we'd probably have a lot more damage here. You would also note that there would be a lot of heat uh, marks on this as well if there was a ton of spinach uh, happening there. You can start to see a little bit of it there. There's a little bit of bluing uh, happening on the rod there um, and that is usually indication of a bearing being spun. There's some bluing for you on that cap. So the most common failure you can see on B58s that we've been seeing in the shop are failed ring lands, right? So we have our, uh, our three sets of rings here. We have our top compression ring, we have our middle ring, and then we have our oil control rings on the bottom. Uh, basically too much cylinder pressure from too much boost, too much timing can cause too much pressure in the cylinder and it pushes down really hard on this piston and it causes cracking to occur between the ring lands here and that will uh, cause uh, a loss of compression. So what we've been seeing is that the bottom half of this piston here where the skirt is very, very skinny uh, has been failing and breaking off, falling into the oil pan and then we lose compression on that cylinder. You'll see on the new CP piston set that we uh, have to put this motor back together that that piston area is reinforced considerably. All right, let's flip this over and uh, pull the rest of the rod caps off and get these pistons out. After removing the damaged rod, Michael removes the other five and checks for potential damage from metallic debris. Spun bearings are notorious for destroying every bearing surface they reach. Now this one is definitely... Uh, About to? It's uh, oh, no. maybe even worse than the other one. You're kidding. Look at that guy. Oh. It didn't, like it didn't spin inside here. Oh wow. But it, but it like it melted did. itself oh, wow. to Look the... Eesh. Oh that's... No wonder it was so tight to spin yeah. over. <laughs> like it's not melted to the crank. This is not a tool you would normally put on an engine. I think I think it started to spin. The tabs probably like stuck to each other. Holy guacamole. That's, yep. that's really bad. 
Removing the rods revealed the worst case scenario, a ruined crankshaft. With nothing left to do but replace it, Ty and Michael continue stripping down the block for a complete rebuild. Yeah, before the crankshaft can come out, we're just looking to remove this final uh, intermediate, what they refer to as an intermediate timing chain. So we're trying to crush this tensioner down, hold it in place here, um, and get a locking pin in here so that we can get this tensioner out without it flying apart. All right, so we just tried a lot of different methods for removing a very stuck bolt, including force, heat, curse words, multiple technicians, all to no avail. Unfortunately, the idler bolt here, which is about, a, I believe, an M10 thread, so a pretty thick thread, Loctite it into the block directly. There's no access from behind. Uh, the head is twisted off here despite our best attempts not to do any damage. So right now we're going to uh, have Michael weld a little nut on top of that bolt and we're gonna try to break it loose with a standard uh, socket in hopes that we can get that bolt out there. So not a good thing, but we will work around it, I'm sure. Unable to remove the intermediate shaft bolt, the next best option was cutting the chain. Removing the chain finally freed the crankshaft and left the block as bare as it would be before heading off to the machine shop for a deep clean. If we just done that from the beginning. We would have been done already. <laughs> Not exactly ideal, but you have to keep moving with less than 24 hours till the deadline. So everything came apart pretty easily except we got down to the uh, intermediate shaft uh, on the timing chain and that bolt was on there really good. If we weren't in such a time crunch, we would have a uh, little time to like get the right tools and figure it out. but. We needed to get the block there uh, about an hour ago and uh, we're already gonna be late. So hopefully we'll still get it all done. Now we gotta go source the parts that we broke and messed up. But let's look back and uh, take a look at all the damage that happened to this engine. All right, so we've got the entire block apart. We've got all the parts laid out on the table here. Um, we looked at all of the main caps and the main bearings and they all look good except for the thrust bearing has some uh, wear on the cap side. Um, it's not terrible, but you can see the coating has worn off in the center of it. Um, that's really the only issue on the mains. The other side of it even still looks good. But when you come over to the pistons and rods and uh, the rod bearings, there were three out of the six that were completely destroyed. Um, you can see the bearing material start, starting to sheet off of here. So it, uh, yeah, they were basically almost fused together like that. Um, you can see how oval that is also when it starts hammering that out, it starts to shrink in. So these were stuck onto the crank. Um, they didn't spin inside the bores on all of them, just that one that got hot here. But uh, either way, we're gonna upgrade all of these. We're gonna put some Carrillo rods in there, some CP pistons, so uh, we won't be using any of these anymore. All right, well, that's pretty much it for teardown. Everything's apart. We got a lot of cleanup to do and then we're ready to put this thing back together and turn it into a race engine and... Yeah, we got all of our parts here. Uh, everything's all set and ready to go. It's pretty much just assembly at this point. So I guess tune in next time to see us put this B58 back together. Hey guys, and welcome back to episode two of the B58 teardown series. Here today, we're gonna be building things up instead of tearing them down. We have all of our brand new engine components laid out here ready for assembly. And we're gonna be putting together all of these brand new shiny bottom end components to make this engine make the most power it can and be as reliable as possible for Michael when he's on track. What I have laid out here for you is our new billet rod and piston assemblies, and we're gonna be putting this together here before the engine block comes back from the machine shop, which is where it's at right now, so that we can save some time on the assembly process. So for those of you who are not familiar with this process, at this point in time, you would have picked out what components you're going to be utilizing to assemble your motor, and we've already done that, right? So here we have Carrillo H-beam billet rods, much stronger than factory, and we're gonna be using upgraded King coated engine bearing. Here I have a failed engine bearing from the motor that we disassembled, and we have a brand new bearing. We're also gonna be using CP pistons. These are coated pistons. They have a thermal dispersion coating on the top. They have a skirt coating on the side, and they're much, much stronger. Their shape is different. They have a slightly different compression ratio. A couple different things they're gonna factor into making this motor allow it to make the most power possible. 
Part of the thing that I can share with you as somebody who does this every day for a living is cleanliness is key, right? You want to keep a super clean workspace for yourself. You want to keep things uh, very well organized. There's a lot of small parts. You've also likely invested a lot of money and that's obviously a serious investment uh, for whatever project that you're working on. So we're going to want to make sure that we cross our T's and dot our I's here as we get this assembly process going. Okay, so we're going to get going on the assembly of this bottom end components. We're a little bit out of order here with the block still at the machine shop, so we're going to be going out of order. Normally what I would do with an engine build to start this process would be to file fit the piston rings to the bore, and which we're going to get into a little bit later when that block comes back. But for right now, we're going to skip ahead in the process and we're going to start by uh, assembling our pistons and rods. So. Uh, here we have this uh, beautiful CP forged piston and this beautiful Carrillo h beam connecting rod and we are going to make these two pieces one. And in order to do that, uh, there's a few parts of the process that are involved. Okay, so here we have a uh, new wrist pin. Uh, this is part of the CP piston package and this is a much stronger and thicker wrist pin than the stock factory wrist pin. So we're going to be installing this with our new pistons and rods. We also have our performance coated bearings here to replace the factory bearings. These have a performance top coating on them and they are usually made to the same specification of oil clearance as the factory. However, certain manufacturers also make these bearings with additional clearances depending on what type of oil you're going to be using, climate you're going to be using the car in, power ratings, you name it. There's a whole bunch of different factors we can get involved with here. We're not going to touch on that now, but just know that there are many, many different choices for bearings. So one helpful tip is usually when you're at this stage, you have a lot of parts in front of you. And what I like to do is do the same step over and over again, um, basically six times, right? So in order to start this assembly process, we need to install the wrist pin clip on one side of the piston. And so what I'm going to go ahead and do is install that same clip on all six pistons so that when we go to assemble, the process stays fluid and you keep doing the same thing over and over again and you don't forget anything, right? So it's very easy to forget if you just do one full assembly at a time, put it down, walk away, come back, you might forget a part. So it's easy to do this uh, in a way where you just keep going consistently, do it over and over again and it will help with your efficiency in the assembly process as well. Okay, so the very first part of this process is we're taking our piston and our wrist pin clip, which I have partially installed here. We're gonna be taking this screwdriver and a moderate amount of force and working that wrist pin around the edge here. I like to use a small screwdriver or a flat blade pick and you basically have to work that clip in and again it's very tight to its little home. So now that that wrist pin clip is in we're going to go ahead and flip the piston over on the other side and we're going to begin the process of installing the rod to the piston. Uh, part of the process involves splitting the lower end cap from the upper part of the rod. So I've already gone ahead and done that. We've removed our very, very fancy and expensive uh, car bolt hardware. These are much stronger bolts than the factory torque to yield bolts. So they will prevent uh, the cap from splitting off the bottom of the rod, which is a common failure of higher horsepower engines. Okay, so we're gonna get started on assembly here. We're gonna go ahead and take this uh, rod here and we're gonna lubricate the uh, end of the wrist pin journal here of the rod with some Liquid Molly 5W40 synthetic. And we're gonna take our piston and we're going to join these two pieces together. So I'm going to take our rod, I'm going to take the other clip, and our wrist pin. I'm going to start this process by lubricating the wrist pin because the rod journal has already been lubricated. And we're going to want to use a fair amount of this liquid molly synthetic oil. We have our piston on its side, the wrist pin clip is installed on the far side, and we're going to gently install the rod and the piston assembly itself. And we're going to take this wrist pin and gently feed it through the assembly. And once that's fully installed, you'll see that on the other side it's stopped because that wrist pin clip is installed, so it cannot go any further. And these two assemblies are now one. We're gonna now take our other wrist pin clip and we're going to install it in the other wrist pin clip journal. Okay. Okay, so one thing I want to talk about here real fast as well with the stock piston and rod assembly is the factory bearing uses a plastic coating on the top. As you can see here, it's orange. They added that uh, on this motor, I believe, to help cut down on uh, upper rod bearing wear from automatic start-stop, which puts a lot of undue stress on the engine components, specifically the bearings. So what you'll find in aftermarket bearings, however, is that this coating is not present. And so I have a top and a bottom shell here from these King bearings, and you'll see that they're both the same exact color and the same exact shape and size. And that's pretty standard for an aftermarket bearing, so don't be too worried if the package of bearings that you open up at home has a different coating on it than the factory. Obviously, this is a different application. We're building a high-performance version of this engine, and what we took apart was a streetcar engine. Okay, so at this point, our piston and rod assembly are one, and now all we have left to do is install the bearings. So we have our two bearing shells here. We have our upper and lower. You can tell because the tabs 
uh, have alignment locators on them. They're like these little tiny tabs on the side. And that'll usually go in only one way with the rod. So we're going to line that up there. Gently place that into the rod assembly. Okay, that's done. And our other side. Line that up nicely. Press that in. And you want to make sure that the bearing shell edge aligns with the edge of the rod. And that'll usually happen kind of naturally on its own when you tighten everything up, but for the sake of assembly, it's important that that is aligned as well. And basically, you take your two halves. This is what we'll sandwich over the journal of the crankshaft. We'll use a fair amount of assembly lubricant when we put these two parts together. But for now, I'm just going to put these two halves together, like so. Gently install the hardware. and put this completed assembly aside. Okay, and so now that this assembly is complete, we're gonna rinse and repeat five more times. And after that, we're gonna spend some time uh, showing you how you install the delicate piston rings onto the piston ahead of installation at the lower end. All right, guys, we were lucky enough to get the block back from the machine shop immediately, and here we are on to our next step, which is the piston rings. So uh, Michael and I just took a few minutes to file fit these piston rings to the bore. I'm gonna walk you through a little bit about that right now. Uh, each piston has three rings on it. You have an upper compression ring that's usually made out of chrome. You have a second, they call a Napier style ring, which is a step ring. That's an oil scraper ring uh, that has a unique profile on it that helps uh, evacuate oil from the cylinder liners. And then you have the bottom oil control rings, which are made up of three separate pieces. You have your scraper and your two um, retainers. And these three rings make up uh, basically what is mounted onto any piston in any application. And so we file fit these to the bore using some math. So uh, for this example, um, we uh, took the bore size, multiplied that by 55 thou. For the top, we got uh, about 20 thousandths. And for the bottom ring, we chose to set at 25 thousandths. You always want your second ring gap to be bigger than your top ring gap. Um, that just helps evacuate any unnecessary or extra pressure in that cylinder. All right, so I just want to touch base real fast and what I mean by when we're filing the rings down. So each ring has an end gap, as you can see here. And basically what we use is we install this one by one in the bore, each ring individually, and we measure it to a certain end gap. And we do that by using feeler gauges. So we've determined that these gaps on the top ring are going to be uh, 20 thousandths. So we have a 20 thousandths uh, thickness feeler gauge here. We would install this in the bore. We would take a piston, which wouldn't be mounted to the rod, push that ring down to the appropriate gap of where it would sit on the piston. And then we would take our feeler gauge and align it with that gap and ensure that there is a nice tight fit against that feeler gauge while it sits in the bore in its correct location. So this one, like I said, we've already measured all of these. So this is 20 thou. I'm taking my feeler gauge. I'm inserting it in that gap in the ring. And it's got a nice little bit of drag on it, which means that we're right on the money. And we basically just repeat that process six times, and then we do each ring. We usually measure the top ring, the compression ring, and the bottom ring, the oil ring. Nine times out of ten, from my experience, the oil control rings, these very thin oil rings that are on the bottom with the scraper ring, are more than adequate in terms of gap. They just call for 15 thousandths out of the box, and nine times out of ten, they are more than plenty. That's not really something that you have to worry about. So now that that's done, uh, we're going to go ahead and we've matched each one uh, to a corresponding bore number. So we're going to take these rings and we're going to uh, install them onto the pistons ahead of installation. So I like to start with the bottom uh, oil control ring. It's the most delicate. It's also the easiest to install. It's a pretty fragile piece. And before we actually install this physically into the bore, which will come a little bit later, we're going to ensure that the orientation of all three different rings uh, is correct. And there is a wrong and a right way to do that. Uh, and so we will make sure that before we actually put these in the bore that all of the ring end gaps are in the correct location ahead of installation so that there isn't any chance uh, of compression getting by from incorrect installation. And that would basically just happen if you imagine putting all three rings that all have gaps uh, in the same exact orientation. You'd actually have a gap uh, down the side of the piston and you wouldn't make any compression. It would be pretty rare and pretty hard to do, but it is certainly possible. So we're going to go ahead and install this bottom ring first, which we've done. And then we'll be moving on to the second oil compression ring, oil scraper ring, sorry. OK, 
Again, a pretty delicate process here. One that takes a little bit of time to get the right feel for. But once you've done it a bunch of times, it's pretty easy to do. Just gonna kind of work that over the edge. Okay. So I got one more here for the bottom. Just taking a look around to make sure that I didn't do anything wrong. Never hurts to double check yourself, especially when you're assembling $4,000 worth of bottom end engine parts in a motor that's gonna make 700 horsepower. Okay. All right, so now we have one uh, completely assembled piston. Our rod cap is on with our bearings. All three rings are installed and this has all been measured up. This is our cylinder number one. Uh, so we're gonna put this aside and move on and repeat the process five more times. Installing the rings in the pistons is a delicate process. Any mistake could cause catastrophic damage inside the engine. Tyler carefully assembles each of the remaining five pistons, ensuring all of the rings are installed correctly before moving on to the next step. All right guys, we're moving right along here in our process and after our piston and rods have been assembled, it is actually time to start assembling the bottom end of the engine. So, in order to do that, we've prepared our block, making sure it's crystal clean and there's no contamination whatsoever. And we're gonna move on with installing the crankshaft main bearings. So, in my hand here, I have an upper main bearing. This is also known as the guide bearing. So one bearing on the main bearing set is used as a thrust bearing, and that controls the direction of movement of the crank laterally in the block, and that limits it from going too far when you push on the clutch or when it's at idle. So first things first, we're gonna put this bearing in. We're gonna install all of the main bearings on the bottom, and then we're gonna lay the crankshaft in with some plastic gauge, which is the tool that we're gonna to use to measure the oil clearance. One thing I'd like to note is that the difference between an upper main bearing or the one that sits in the actual top half of the block and the lower half is that the upper main bearing has an oil groove cut into it and this is to promote obviously uh, lubrication and keep oil in place on the crankshaft. So these are the bearings that go in the upper half of the block and the bearings that are installed in the main caps are flat and they do not have a groove and that is the way that you can tell the difference. A lot of BMW engines are made this way. So if you find yourself putting together one of these engines, there's a quick tip for you. In this particular engine, we have seven main journals. I'm gonna proceed with installing. And one thing to note, we're putting these in dry right now because we're gonna be using plastic gauge and we don't want any contamination of that with oil or any other foreign bodies. So these are just going in right now, completely dry. And we're going to then lay in the crankshaft. We've taken the time already to lay in the upper half of the main bearing shells. And we're going to be installing the crankshaft. Once we put those in, we're taking some plastic gauge, which is a tool you may or not may be familiar with, and that is basically a calibrated measuring device. So what we do is we put the main bearings in first, along with these new ARP uh, main bearing studs, which is an upgrade over the factory torque shield fastener. And we lay some of this plastic gauge in on the bearing as we drop it into uh, the block here with the crankshaft. We're gonna install the main bearing caps and tighten them down to spec, and then remove the crankshaft once again and when we do that, we can actually check the oil clearance of the main bearings thanks to this calibrated measuring device known as plastic gauge. So basically, the way that this works is it is a, a particular thickness and as we tighten it down, the lesser the clearance, the wider the line will get. So basically, once we tighten everything down, we can take this plastic gauge measuring scale here, we lay it next to the plastic gauge that's been laid in the bore and we can identify uh, what the oil clearance is on the main bearings by using this little graph. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and install the main bearing caps. These are numbered. Also, should note, number four matches our thrust bearing. So as we can see, this bearing has sides to it as well. These caps have alignment tabs on them as well. We're making sure that we line them up with the tabs that are in the block. It can only be installed in one direction. So now that the caps are on, I'm gonna take this new hardware. I'm gonna use some ARP fastener lubricant. This is important to use when installing ARP style hardware. And that just ensures that we get the correct torque on the fastener after we install it. Usually if you install it dry or without oiling the fastener, 
Um, you'll get that like skipping sensation that you may or may not be familiar with when you're tightening a bolt down. Uh, and that creates an inaccurate torque value. And of course ARP unfortunately varies in their fastener size and hardware type and this is different than the factory hardware. Something you should be aware of because then you will find yourself chasing a very rare 12 millimeter 12 point socket which is apparently very hard to come by. We're going to torque it all down to spec and then we're going to pull everything back apart and we're going to check to see what our oil clearances are and ensure that we don't have any clearance issues. And if that all looks good, we can actually proceed with installing this crankshaft and main bearings all the way, and then the piston and rod assemblies, which will then complete the majority of our bottom end assembly. For those of you at home who are watching and you're wondering, you know, do I need to use plastic gauge? I would say that the answer is yes, and let me give you a few reasons why. We're using a crankshaft that came from a different uh, engine altogether. It is a B58 crankshaft of a similar production date, but it is from a different engine. We're also using a set of aftermarket bearings. They're not factory VNW OEM bearings. They haven't been ordered by VIN number. So we don't know what the specification is of the clearance of that. We need to verify that information. Uh, we're using uh, different fasteners that require a different torque spec than factory. So there are a lot of factors here at play and a very simple process, which is, you know, seems redundant because we're assembling something to take it back apart, but we definitely want to make sure our clearances are correct here on something like these main bearings, because if they weren't, we're going to find that the crankshaft either doesn't spin, or if it does run and it does spin, and there isn't enough clearance for the oil to get in there at higher RPMs and higher loads, we're going to find that there isn't enough cushion for the pushing, and that crankshaft is going to seize up in no time. All right, so we've installed the crankshaft and now we've taken it back out after torquing it down to specification and we're using our plastic gauge here, which I'm gonna show you how to do this or what we're doing here up close and personal. And you can see that this uh, has um, a few different measurements on it. So we basically just take this here and we line this up and we can see that that line is a, basically as thick as the second one up, which is two thousandths of clearance. And that line pretty much matches consistently through all of the journals that we measured here. The majority of the clearances are at 2,000. Basically, we're good to go. We're going to clean this plastic gauge off. Uh, Michael's lubricating the bearings, the Liquid Molly engine assembly paste. And then we're going to put this crankshaft in, tighten everything up, and then we'll flip it over, get it on the stand so that we can install the pistons and rods. So you'll also see a lot of times when you put the caps on it and you just snug them down, the crank won't turn that well and then you tighten them down and it turns better. So the bores are actually oval, and then as it cranks down, that's when they become round. So having the torque set when they line bore the engine is really important. Otherwise, when you torque it down, it'll become oval, and that's when you have problems. All right, so now that we've got the crankshaft, main bearings installed, the crank is installed, and everything's torqued up to spec, we're gonna move on with some basic reassembly here. So we'll start off by uh, installing the rear lower timing chain and cover, which we've sealed up with some specialty silicone and uh, just a couple other little accessories that we can put on the side of the block while we're waiting for some other processes to take place. And then we'll be able to uh, get going with the piston and rod installation. All right, so we're getting ready to assemble the bottom end. The crank is in now, and we're gonna put the pistons in. Um, all we have is a universal piston ring compressor, uh, which obviously you can tell is not completely round. It's some thin sheet metal that kind of wraps around it and squeezes the rings in place. Um, so you got to be careful when you use these as you're tapping it in it's pretty easy for the piston to kind of get a little bit crooked and especially the oil ring on the bottom they're very thin it can catch you just hammer it in you're going to bend that ring and it's never going to be right so we're also using the uh, liquid moly classic which is non-synthetic we'll use this oil to start up um, in the first maybe 100 miles of driving and then we'll put in synthetic oil and that way the rings have a chance to seat and the reason that we're doing that is that Synthetic oil is so slippery that these rings actually will never uh, wear in and seat properly into the bores of the cylinders. So you'll always have blow by. So, uh, so one thing that we're going to pay attention to here as well, most piston sheets will come with a, uh, with a uh, instruction set that will tell you which position to orient the rings in. Uh, as I explained earlier in the video, we need to be careful to ensure that we don't have all of the ring sets perfectly with the gap aligned, otherwise it will not generate compression. The compression will just bypass the ring set. It'll go into the crankcase, and unfortunately there's really no way to spin that mm -hmm. back around, so you'd be taking your motor back apart. So you wanna make sure we offset the rings, the top and the second ring, 180 degrees out from one another. 
before we install it in the bore, and they'll pretty much stay that way in that orientation, I think, for its entire life. Yep. And uh, and that'll prevent any uh, blow by or loss of compression. It's pretty easy to forget to do that right before you go to put the piston back in, so it's something I always make sure to double check before installation. The tip with this when installing the piston with one of these universal compressors is to go nice and easy and kind of work your way back and forth, left to right. You don't want to keep hitting it in the same spot because the piston can bind in the tool as you install it, and then it will break a ring, and all this will be for nothing. And anytime you're installing the pistons, you want to make sure that if you feel any extra resistance as it's going down, that means something's wrong. So stop, pull it back out, check it, make sure nothing's hanging up. We have cylinders one and six uh, installed now in the bores. We're going to install and tighten the rod caps, and then those two cylinders will be done. We'll rotate the engine over to the next pair, and so on and so forth. Ty and Mike install the remaining pistons in the respective pairs, torquing each rod cap to spec as they move along. It's a relatively slow process, ensuring each bolt is tightened enough at the right stage. Once the final torque is set, the guys move to install the oiling system. All right, so the oil pump's all back together, basically disassembled the entire thing. Um, so it does have a screen in here, and in the screen, we had quite a bit of uh, the bigger metal debris. So we got all that out of there, cleaned the screen out, but obviously these holes are fairly large, so a lot of small debris got into the oil pump. Um, so we wanted to take that uh, all that debris out of there, got it apart, cleaned it all out, and something else we did was uh, the back half of this oil pump is actually a vacuum pump. So the brake booster, uh, to have the power assist brakes, doesn't work off the intake manifold, drawing vacuum. Um, I think because it's a turbo car, they wanted to try to make it more consistent. Instead of putting a check valve in that hose, they built a vacuum pump into the oil pump, uh, but we don't run a brake booster so we took that, basically disassembled that and left that apart. So this is just a hollow, um, basically back half of the oil pump is now just, it doesn't do anything. This is all cleaned up and ready to go. So we're gonna put this thing back on. Um, I've also already filled it with oil and rotated a bit. So that way when we do a startup, it'll be able to create a lot of vacuum, draw the oil up and get oil pressure quickly. All right, so basically you're looking at a complete bottom in here, uh, oil pan, Oil pump drive, all that stuff's on. Timing chains in the back are installed. All six pistons and rods are installed and torqued. Michael's threading in the uh, front crank pulley bolts here. We're gonna spin this thing over by hand here real quick just to make sure everything feels the way that it should. So basically when you spin a motor over after you've done all this kind of work to it, spin this nice and easy. And I'm using two fingers here. Make sure nothing feels like it's binding. Everything is looking good. Keep going. What do you think, Mike? Is she going to be a runner? Looks good to me. All right. I think that feels pretty good. We're going to leave the pistons kind of at a midway position for when we install the head. We don't impact any valves. Okay, so uh, we installed the head gasket and uh, we've got the cylinder head all cleaned up. We prepped the surface, removed all the old gasket material. Uh, we just installed the ARP625 head studs in place. Michael's laying in the uh, head bolt washers. And uh, then we're going to be torquing this head up and pretty much uh, after that's done, we got to run the timing chains, bolt on the external accessories, and maybe put it back in the car tomorrow. The cylinder head assembly is an extremely important piece as it carries the valves and camshafts that let air in and out of the engine. Torquing the head to the block is another involved process that requires each nut to be torqued in a specific sequence multiple times for a proper head gasket seal. It's a massive step in the rebuild process and is the last one before Ty and Mike can set the engine timing. Early the next morning. All right, well, we put in a lot of time yesterday. Yeah. We're almost back together now. Um, we got a few things to finish up. We got to do the timing, right? Yeah, I got to finish up the timing. Uh, you can keep going on the accessories on the outside, so I'll handle that and uh, keep putting this thing back up together and hopefully get it ready for you to put it back in the car shortly. Sounds good. Okay, so right now what I'm doing is I'm, uh, I'm finding top dead center using a dial indicator, which is uh, different than obviously the factory method, it's a little more accurate. Um, normally we would be slipping uh, the pin that comes in the timing tool set into the flywheel, but because this car and this engine have an aftermarket flywheel assembly, and right now it's on an engine stand, this is just another way to do this. So um, basically it's just a uh, perfectly level bridge with a dial indicator, uh, we're using a small extension. And uh, basically what happens is we just like uh, keep spinning the motor over until that gauge zeroes out and once we uh, once we get that zero point um, The gauge will go from one direction to the other. That's when we uh, Basically understand that the travel 
um, of the engine has stopped and we find a zero point uh, by taking an average of the two values and then uh, we set it at TDC and then from there we can time the cams. So basically that it's going to come all the way up and yeah. there's going to be some dwell which is the top of the piston just sitting there for maybe a couple degrees and then it'll start to drop back down. So he's looking for that point going back and forth up and down finding where it's at its highest point and then we'll kind of like guess on the dwell and that's going to be within a degree of top dead center. If we were going to be super accurate about this, which you would on an engine that has a much more adjustable or variable camshaft time setting, um, you would like really want to find that zero point and like really hone in on it. So we don't have to do that with this. Um, this motor can compensate for quite a few degrees, I think, in slop uh, from the assembly. That pin that you stick in the crankshaft is really not that accurate. So um, this is more accurate than that. So I'm, I'm happy with what we just found there. We'll be good to go. So now I can, uh, we know that cylinder one is at the top to the center. We have our cam jig installed, so we're going to uh, lock the uh, Vanos units in place, tighten everything up, the motor's timed, that's it. Now that they've completed all the major work, just the last few pieces of the puzzle remain. Ancillaries, like the power steering pump, alternator, and oil filter housing, need to be bolted on, and then the rebuilt B58 will be ready to reunite with the 340i. All right, so we're almost done. Uh, basically, one of the last things to do is put the valve cover on. We're gonna get that on there, uh, get the engine wiring harness on, and then we can take it off the engine stand, get it on the hoist, get the clutch bell housing on it, we can drop this thing in the car. So on the top of the engine here, uh, from the factory, is a high pressure fuel pump. And underneath here on the camshaft, there's actually another cam lobe that's pushing the high pressure fuel pump back and forth, bumping up the pressure to, I don't know, what is it, 10? or it's maybe like It's 20, like 2,500 PSI. Okay, so a lot of bar. Yep, Yep. 30 bar. Um, so this is a block off plate because we don't run the direct fuel injection anymore. We run port injection just for basically simplification. Um, also the factory fuel system is not, uh, doesn't flow nearly enough fuel for this kind of power. Yeah, you're limited by the injector size with uh, direct injection. Um, probably also worth noting too, in terms of things that you've removed from this motor are also the Valtronic system which if you're interested in knowing how that works, you can look up online. There's a lot of videos you can check out about how BMW Valtronic system works. This has been locked out because he's running MoTeC. So the intake valve lift is uh, completely open to a maximum percentage. And then he controls the throttle again now just with a regular throttle butterfly. Yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool system, very complex, but um, kind of is a streetcar situation, yeah, right? Mean, For good mileage and, and response yeah, it's at more very like low a, RPM. Yeah, it's more of an efficiency thing, um, but I think the best way I can sum up like what he's done here is he's taken a very, very complex engine and made it run a lot simpler, like, like, like a lot of you are used to, and it makes it a lot easier to diagnose at the track. You have to carry a lot less parts with you. All the stuff is more readily available. You're not using anything yeah. specialty. So uh, he's basically dumbed down a very, very complicated um, intake and fuel system, which is definitely helpful when you're at the track. Yeah, and you know, we're not looking for Efficiency. Uh, yeah, idle to 2500 RPM efficiency or response, we're always above that. Just wide so, open throttle, baby. Uh, it's kind of like a big lift cam in a race motor yeah. at this point. All right, well, we got this engine completely assembled. All the accessories are on it, and we're ready to uh, put it on the cherry picker, put the bell housing clutch, transmission on, pop this thing in the car. Uh, but Tyler has to go back to work and uh, work on some more BMW engines. <laughs> That's right. Right, day to day. Uh, thank you so much for coming down and yeah, helping us no out problem. with this. Uh, I learned a lot about the engine, yeah. and uh, yeah, can't wait to get this thing in and get it running. It's been my pleasure, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm glad I you know, could help you guys out, lend you guys a hand. Um, this was a cool experience for me, being able to knock this out in a 24-hour period was pretty, uh, less than actually. Yeah, um, exactly. From tear down to rebuild, that's pretty cool. And um, I'm sure you guys have it more than squared away getting this thing back in the car, and hopefully I'll see you tomorrow to help you guys shred this thing. Appreciate it, man. All right, yeah. All right. thank you. Thanks, guys.